eh, a cargo de doctor Anuk Mubashi de la Universidad de Illinois de Estados Unidos. Eh, y su título, perdón, su título es Modeling eh, COVID-19 Transmission Dynamics and Control Strategies in Close Contact Facilities. Bueno, adelante. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. Um, okay, I think you all can see my screen. Um, okay, see me, my friends here. And the, so greetings to everyone. I can be um, Juan Aprecio and... Uh, also greetings, many things, my here. friend. Greetings, greetings. How are you doing? Um, uh, Waiting I'll... for your talk. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I also see Pedro um, and um, Jorge Velasco and many other folks. So greetings to everyone. Uh, thank you for being here and also here. Gerard and uh, Graciela to inviting me for the talk. Uh, it's very kind of you. Um, by the way, I am in Medellin, Colombia right now, so uh, very close to you all. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, well, this is a preliminary work with uh, one of my students. I was uh, debating what to present, and I thought this is very interesting work. I thought of presenting it. Um, this work is in uh, collaboration with uh, Dominica. She's a, she was a Yachitek student, but now she's uh, doing PhD at Max Planck Institute, Germany. Uh, Aditi Ghosh, she's a um, professor at uh, University of Wisconsin, but she will be moving to Texas A&M University. And um, also Susan Lenhard, uh, she's at uh, Nimboys, and you, many of you might know her. Um, she's very good in optimal control, very well known. Um, so, uh, well, uh, so let me see if I can move my slide. So, um, so today I will be talking about first is what is a close contact means when I saw about close contact facilities um, and what are the factors that are critical in modeling it, um, uh, like super spreading events or um, controls. How do you manage to uh, kind of design or built into these models, um, which are very well known in the field, but um, I think we are doing it with a twist and uh, might be interesting to many of you. Uh, and finally, the results and implications from our work. Uh, so before we go, and I think you may be knowing many of these things, but it is very important to discuss that builds upon the topic that I'm talking about. Why coronavirus has been successful? Well, 40% um, uh, of the transmission is uh, before the patient actually shows the symptoms. Uh, so that is very critical. Um, and that's why it has been successful, unlike many other uh, outbreaks in the, in the past. Um, and uh, well, 20% of the people are responsible for most of the transmission, 80% of the transmission. So very few are kind of um, responsible for the most of the um, infection. And uh, last uh, point is very critical for it, super spreading that has been observed again and again. For example, in Singapore, conference as company in uh, around January last year um, and there was 190, 109 guests um, and there was a single person who was from Wuhan China um, and it uh, uh, that attendee infected seven at other at attendees during the conference and eventually um, that becomes a pandemic that resulted in the pandemic world over this seven people. Um, from the gas company. So this was the first one that started an outbreak in the whole world. Um, and then the South Korea outbreak was started by a 61 year old woman who attended the uh, church um, with roughly four, uh, four hours of service uh, time. And she infected 60 people in that. And that started a South Korea um, outbreak. So these are very relevant and very important events in the COVID um, uh, history. 
Okay, so um, when I'm talking about close contact facilities, I'm talking about something like uh, church, nursing homes, uh, long-term care facilities. Um, so nursing home has been specifically um, well known in the news lately. Almost 80% of the death has been in US um, among the 65 years old. And um, especially nursing home until, <clears throat> until COVID came, it has been less funded very badly funded in the US. Um, they didn't have the healthcare workers working in that area, didn't have test protective gears. Um, and um, while well, the policies were very contradictory, they, there hasn't been any modeling work uh, that has evaluated the policies in these facilities, for example, what type of policies will be best in those locations. <clears throat> so, um, and in fact, there is equally, um, uh, uh, reasonable close contact facilities has been cruise ships, for example. Um, Ruby Princess was considered as the first um, um, uh, ship which had 1,500 people, and um, they were allowed to disembark in Sydney, and that started an outbreak in Australia. And, um, um, and eventually that Ruby Princess um, passengers Travel to US and that has started an outbreak even in US um, and uh, also in some countries um, uh, apart from US. So it was very important from COVID-19 literature that how this cruise ship became um, uh, uh, grounds for a pandemic, the word pandemic that we talk about. Uh, on the other hand, there were two other ships uh, that Diamond Princess and Zendam they were not allowed to um, have, uh, the people, the guests were not allowed to come out of the vessels for uh, almost uh, 20 days. Uh, Diamond Princess was in Japan and Zedan was not even allowed to um, uh, kind of sail in any of the South America's uh, port because of that. So Princess, Ruby Princess was the one people get to know and they were very afraid of it. And they were absolutely correct. These uh, cruise ship, there were many infected people. So these are close contact uh, facilities that I'm talking about. Um, also very, very critical uh, study has been in a restaurant in China um, where one person, this A1 person was infected and he was eating food with uh, family members. Um, and it turns out this person infected long um, uh, in, in other seats also. Um, not only the people around him, um, but also um, in other tables. These are tables, A, B, C, D, these are the tables in the restaurants. And this A1 infected all these red circle eventually. And this was two hours lunch period where there were workers working, staff members and 83 customer members that came in and out during that two hour session. And this affected uh, almost 10. Uh, the important thing about this example was that this person infected long uh, people sitting long distance from this, um, this person. And one of the reasons they find out later on was the uh, environmental conditions, like in the, this case, air conditioning unit was the, you know, responsible for the infection. So environmental conditions do play a very important role. And these people uh, who were sitting on the same table didn't got infected. So very critical, uh, very critical aspect for indoor facilities um, that was highlighted in this example. So in US, for example, it, the most of the um, outbreak started from a King County. It is considered as the starting point in US. Of course, there were small infected cases in many places in the US, but primarily the um, outbreak as such was well known in King County in Washington state. Um, and basically most of the people that were impacted there were long-term care facilities like nursing homes. And um, they didn't know how to control it. It was one after another long-term care facilities in the King County got infected. So 30 reported facilities uh, in 2.5 weeks in a very short span of time got infected. So um, very important event in the historical perspective. And this is what we are talking, talking about a close contact uh, facilities. So um, in fact, we were dig the literature and we found after the outbreak has ended in these King County, 
King County was the county in the Washington state. We were able to get this uh, outbreak and we were able to see this distributions of how the changes are happening in the residents and healthcare professionals working in the long-term care facilities and visitors who are coming and meeting um, their family members who lives in long-term care facilities. So the infections, these are number of cases and how many cases changes over time. Very well defined an outbreak. And we use this as a primer to, to study the policies in the long-term care facilities. Okay. Um, we take the literature and we try to find it out what has been done in the long-term care facilities, our close contact in general. Well, we find uh, many studies like first study were not having the, um, uh, uh, this was done in the nursing home for elderly, but it didn't have any environmental transformation and to take into account, which was very critical for COVID, for example. Um, and then there was um, another one in a cruise ship, um, but there wasn't any heterogeneous mixing. It was very simple homogeneous models with some asymptomatic in infections. Um, there was another one with uh, optimal control for Ebola, um, but there wasn't any structured population in that. Um, and then there was another study where we uh, it talked about um, uh, controlling something, but there was static controls. There was, they were not changing over time. It was a constant static, which we know for sure in case of COVID it didn't work. So, so these were a deficiency that you are seeing in the square bracket that we were not finding in any literature that we could use. Uh, and then there was a one model that captured some controls, but there were only unique one control that was uh, deciding environmental control uh, transmission, but very simple models. And uh, basically they were trying to capture the periodicity, but nothing about more than one controls in that. So there were limitations in almost all of them from our perspective, from a COVID-19 perspective in a close contact facilities. So. Um, so then we actually kind of uh, decided to build upon the limited uh, literature. And um, uh, the goal was, the threefold goals was to first to model these mechanisms, what are seen in the long-term care facility transmission pathways. Um, and by the way, pardon that I'm talking in English and uh, I wish uh, Zoom was more sophisticated, can translate into Spanish subtitles, but uh, we are not yet there. <laughs> so we have three sub objective here. First was to model a long-term care facilities uh, transmission pathways. What are the transmission pathways that are there? What are the subpopulations that are important uh, in close contact facilities um, in infection transmission dynamics? Uh, and then how do we design policies, intervention policies for such facilities? And we are not just doing it for the sake of doing another mathematical problems. We have kind of did a quite good literature review also on parameter estimation and, and policy implementations. So um, our approach was that the key subpopulations are residents, healthcare professionals, and visitors. Um, and we took a as a, as a first step, we took into account only two interventions, which was mark skews and cleaning services um, that was uh, critical uh, for COVID-19 specifically. So our model structure was something like this. It has an structured population, so it has subpopulations. It has even an external population like visitors who are going back and forth inside and outside. So they were kind of a carriers for infections. Um, and connection from inside and out, outside. Uh, and then we also take into account environmental transmission, which has been a key in um, COVID-19. Um, mixing has been very, even for other diseases, the mixing has been a very uh, challenging for many of the studies. So we did focus much of the things on heterogeneous mixing. Uh, we also talked about in our model uh, super spreading to infectivity distributions. Uh, so super spreading events, for examples. And then we took into account temporal controls, time dependent. So we use uh, time dependent controls. 
and we uh, had multiple controls in our model. So these were basic structures that built into the model to study um, the long-term care facility dynamics. So it was a very simple model, SEIR type uh, for H stands for healthcare workers, R stands for resident, EV stands for visitors here, and C is basically the environmental infection. Okay, so how is that environmental infection is, um, uh, we come into a few seconds, but it's for a simple uh, in a long prefix facility premise uh, models that we captured in it. Um, we use something very well known in a spatial modeling um, in ecology. It's called as a Levens model. We use a Levens model here, um, and basically, it's it's kind of uh, uh, defines the fraction of the space that is infected um, with pathogens, for example, and um, and we model this transmission uh, using. Um, uh, this nonlinear functions here uh, in this C equations. So very simple ideas. But again, the idea uh, here was um, to understand the, um, the COVID structure of it. And so in the COVID, the super spreader was, uh, was important, but the definition of super spreader was not very clear. Um, so, I mean, in one place, super spreader is considered as based on uh, amount of pathogens that one can carry. So this is a pathogen load. So we define case two as pathogen load. Whereas another definition of super spreader could be high contacts, may not, maybe um, having same type of infection, but meeting different type of, uh, I mean, a person might be meet more frequently social behavior, uh, might be more um, leading to high contacts. So we defined two different ways of super spreading events. And we defined a case one as a no super, uh, super spreader events and a multiple transmission pathways, um, such as environmental transmission. And uh, also one thing to note is the denominators are different, which is taking into account heterogeneous mixing that is found in, in long-term care facilities here. Okay. so. Um, so again, one point was there were two different definitions, pathogen load and healthcare workers. Now, since we are modeling a long-term care facility like nursing homes, the pathogen load uh, should uh, be higher in older people who are re resident here. So we took a resident populations as a super spreader only in this case too. Okay. Whereas in the case three, um, healthcare workers, their job is to meet many patients. Their job is to cater many patients um, or many elderly every day. And therefore, we termed as healthcare workers based on a high contact as a super spreader. Sarah. So very, very thoughtful in that regard, what has been seen in the COVID, um, COVID circumstances. Okay. So... Um, and then on top of it, we built um, uh, optimal controls like mass cues in a standard way. Um, uh, U and U2 is the, what is measuring the efficiency of uh, the mass cues. And then um, uh, cleaning of the surface is going in a typical standard way in these places, which is uh, basically reducing the infection if we use uh, much more, um, if the facility uses higher uh, surface cleaning uh, aspects. Um, and then a standard way of modeling um, uh, this uh, optimal control problem is to study the indirect cost um, or, uh, or um, uh, you know, and the indirect cost from the infections. So W1, W2, W3, W4 are the cost variable of weight per unit cost. And then uh, B1, B2 is the cost of intervention per unit cost, basically also there. And as a standard practice in this work, um, we have uh, shown the existence of an optimal control for this uh, problem uh, in our manuscript. So um, one thing that uh, many of uh, studies lagged in the literature was measuring these um, 
um, estimates of the cost. And so we carry out an extensive um, uh, meta-analysis uh, where we try to estimate the cost of these, each one of the weights. And that's where you need to keep into account the units because uh, this unit should match with the unit, uh, unit of this should match the unit of this. So that unit is very, very important. And that was taken into account to get the per person cost for each one of, of the interventions uh, that we used here. So, um, so the results that we obtain are, uh, for example, the R naught um, uh, uh, that we computed for the case one versus case two versus case three. The case um, three was remember the high contact super spreader, and case two was um, uh, uh, pathogen load related super spreading event. So uh, it turns out the uh, the reproduction number was higher in the case of super spreading event, which is related to high contacts, not because of the high pathogen load. Um, and that was quite uh, interesting, although um, maybe uh, known, but I have not seen many studies that differentiate these uh, definitions on that. So it was a quite interesting features to note from there. And the bottom one was without having any super spreading event. Okay, so um, uh, and when we compared the outbreak size, um, it turns out that the blue, which is having a super spreading event with the uh, with the high number of contacts, um, was early on. The blue was having early peak and high peak, as compared to the other two cases. So, um, so which was expected uh, because the R naught was showing to be much higher uh, for the case three, and so it was expected to have quick and higher peaks for in that case. So, um, but it was not that trivial from looking at the model. Uh, what would be the case um, when it comes to um, using the optimal control? We found that uh, the best policies for this would uh, was early implementation of mark, uh, mask use is the best policy. So brown is a mask use. So fully ex, uh, use your mask early on in an outbreak, whereas environmental cleaning policies should, be, uh, should grow as, as an outbreak should grow. And that two together could um, control an outbreak in a best possible. So these are the uh, optimal policies that we have observed from the, uh, from the model. Well, um, also the environmental transmission that was happening in our model was, um, was again, was very loosely uh, estimated. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty. So we wanted to see the impact of that. So as we increased um, the environmental transmission, uh, we, we expected, as expected, there was higher and early cleaning policies are needed. So you, you see that uh, as we are going towards the blue, these are environmental transmission rate, the amount of our, uh, transmission that is occurring from the environment, the higher we will have to use the interventions for the cleaning. Uh, and you have to maximize early on your efforts, um, which, is, which is expected in that case. Um, but the way uh, it is showing maybe the uh, the dynamics was not uh, absolutely as expected, but uh, but yes, it was expected. So mm, we wanted to see what is happening in different populations also, as number of infected in the in the residents. What uh, what is happening with the controls and no controls? So if no controls, what we were seeing in the resident populations. Uh, controls work better later on. So you see this this fluorescent blue is above. Initially, it was above uh, the darker blue ones. So this one is above this thing. So it was not very, controls were not very helpful in starting, but it was very helpful later on um, in this thing, in resident population. Whereas in healthcare populations, it was early on, it was better, but later on, it was not better under controls in the healthcare, if we subdivide the population and see what is going on in. But if you take both the population into account, 
then it was better everywhere. Uh, the controls were better everywhere. So it kind of averaged it out the impact of these two uh, to show this picture here. So optimal control result in significant decrease in peak and epidemic size as, as was, but also we found when it is actually, which population it is impacting more at, at what time of an outbreak. So I'll end here with some summary here. Um, and um, uh, basically we identify uh, and uh, models key mechanisms that were seen for um, long-term care facility or close contact facilities um, that has been seen in, um, in, in uh, nursing homes for the COVID outbreak. Uh, taking into account different transmission pathways through environments between populations, subpopulations, and um, within populations. Um, and then we define super spreading uh, events, uh, which are critical for um, in two different ways. Um, and the third thing we uh, we identify the which of these policies and, and one, which population it will be better to use what policies um, which are optimal and um, for our case, for our long-term care facilities. So as, as pointed out in one of the pic, uh, graphs that more effort should be given to the cleaning surface at the beginning uh, than efforts of mask strategies. So I want to stop here and thank you for your attentions. If any questions, I will be happy to take. Muchas gracias. Preguntas. Well, no, no questions. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> no, you're welcome. Uh -huh, a ver. I'm sorry. Uh, Sí, sí, adelante. Uh, use of mask. Uh, you hear me? Sí, Juan, eh, así Hello? la pregunta. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, the use of mask is uh, how it's implemented in the model. Yeah, it was a standard way of implementing. Um, I'm sorry. Um, let me see if I can find the slide. Yeah, so here is the use of um, mask were used. And this is how um, the, it's a standard way of uh, depicting the mask okay. and it's basically <laughs> take into account and the efficacy easy. of hmm. okay. is use the world time of the simulation that's true that's very true yes okay okay so there's this a uh, little bit difference that what we did here was um, the how the people build these models for example um, the denominators are usually kept as um, as the constant population or the total population, which is not always the case because there here the mixing populations are very different who you mix with. Not everyone mix with everyone there as homogeneously as in the community, for example. So uh, yeah, the efficacy of the mask has also changed due to how you are building up the term itself, basically. Okay, thank you. Very nice. Sure. Okay. Había alguien más que estaba preguntando? No. Okay. Parece que no. Bueno, muchas gracias.